A beast in the night lawyer Gabriel Utterson is strolling through London with his old friend Richard Enfield when they wander down a quiet lane. There, the men encounter a run-down, neglected door. The derelict entrance reminds Enfield of a story, which he recalls aloud to Utterson. Early one morning, he witnessed a man trample a young girl and continue coolly on his way as she screamed on the ground. Enfield, shocked, caught up with the brute and dragged him back to the scene. He found the man repulsive, without being able to specify why, and threatened him with social ruin unless he paid restitution. Agreeing, the man brought Enfield to that same door, went inside and returned with a 100 pounds check. The check's signature was that of a respectable and important man, leaving Enfield to suspect a case of blackmail. When Utterson asks the name of the man who ran over the girl, Enfield sees no reason not to give it. Hide. Utterson then reveals that he already knows the identity of the reputable man whose account paid the pound 100. The two men, both disapproving of gossip, agree never to speak of this again. Search for Mr. Hyde. Later that evening, Utterson sits in his study, looking over the will of his friend and client doctor, Henry Jekyll. Jekyll has left everything to Edward Hyde, not only in the event of death, but also if Jekyll vanishes for a period of three months. Utterson, frustrated, suspects Hyde is blackmailing Jekyll. He visits Dr. Hasty Lanyon, another of Jekyll's old friends. Lanyon reveals that he and Jekyll have been estranged for a decade because Lanyon objects to Jekyll's fanciful and unscientific research. Utterson returns home, and that night has nightmares about Hyde. When he wakes, he decides he must meet Hyde and waits by the door until the man returns. Hyde's appearance disgusts and scares Utterson. They talk briefly, then Utterson rushes to Jekyll's house. Jekyll is absent, but the butler, Poole, admits him. Poole explains that Hyde has a key to the house and can enter Jekyll's laboratory whenever he wishes. The servants have orders to obey Hyde. Utterson worries that if Hyde discovers the will, he will murder Jekyll to get the inheritance. Dr. Jekyll is quite at ease. Two weeks later, Jekyll gives a dinner party and invites Utterson. After the party, they sit together in front of the fire. When Utterson tries to discuss the will, Jekyll becomes visibly distressed. Jekyll admits that his position is strange, but reassures his friend that he can be rid of Hyde whenever he wishes. He makes Utterson promise to execute the will faithfully and to ensure that Hyde receives his inheritance should the need arise. The Carew Murder Case Almost a year later, a maid witnesses a murder on the streets of London. An elderly member of Parliament, Sir Danvers Carew, meets Hyde in the night. When Carew speaks to Hyde, Hyde attacks him with a cane and clubs Carew to death. Hyde vanishes, leaving his broken cane behind. Carew was carrying a letter addressed to Utterson. When the police visit the lawyer, Utterson recognizes the cane as one he had given to Jekyll and leads the police to Hyde's house. Despite its dingy exterior, Hyde's home is furnished luxuriously. There are signs that he packed in a hurry and burned documents. However, despite the police waiting for him to retrieve his money from the bank, Hyde has disappeared. The Incident of the Letter Utterson goes to visit Jekyll. Poole leads Utterson to the laboratory, which Utterson sees for the first time. Formerly a lecture theater, it is reached by crossing a yard and is windowless and dark. Upstairs is the doctor's cabinet. There, next to the fire, sits a sickly Jekyll. Utterson urgently inquires if Jekyll is hiding Hyde, but Jekyll swears he will never see Hyde again. Jekyll then tells Utterson that he has a letter from Hyde and wants Utterson's opinion as to whether he should show it to the police. His concern is how his reputation would suffer if the connection between himself and Hyde becomes public knowledge. Utterson offers to take the letter for a night and think about what to do. Jekyll confirms Utterson's suspicions that Hyde dictated the terms of Jekyll's will. Needing advice, Utterson invites over his head clerk, Mr. Guest, who knows of Jekyll's connection with Hyde because of their legal dealings. Since Guest is a student of handwriting, Utterson asks him to analyze the letter from Hyde. Guest requests a sample of Jekyll's handwriting so he can compare it with the letter. He determines that the handwritings of Hyde and Jekyll are the same, 
only sloped at opposite angles. After Guest leaves, Utterson locks Hyde's letter in his safe and worries about Jekyll forging the letter he claims was from Hyde. The remarkable incident of Dr. Lanyon time passes, and despite a huge reward on offer, Hyde doesn't reappear. However, many of his crimes and cruelties come to light. Jekyll returns to his old self, entertaining often, and in addition to his charity work, becomes deeply religious. But just two months later, things changed. Just days after Lanyon and Utterson dine with Jekyll, Jekyll shuts himself away and refuses to see Utterson. When Utterson visits Lanyon, Utterson finds his friend looking near to death. Lanyon is pale and appears older, and his eyes are haunted. Lanyon says that he suffered a terrible shock and assumes he will die within a few weeks. When Utterson asks if Lanyon has seen Jekyll, Lanyon reacts with horror. He explains that Jekyll is dead to him and says that Utterson may remain only if he doesn't speak Jekyll's name. When Utterson returns home, he writes to Jekyll to ask about the breach with Lanyon. Jekyll replies mysteriously, saying that Lanyon isn't to blame, but that they must not meet again. Jekyll adds that he will live a life of seclusion in the future, and that Utterson must accept that he isn't allowed to visit. He explains that he has brought on himself a terrible punishment. Two weeks later, Lanyon dies. The night after the funeral, Utterson considers a sealed envelope from Lanyon to be opened after his death. When Utterson opens it, he finds another enclosed, this one not to be opened until after the death or disappearance of Jekyll. Although Utterson makes several attempts to visit Jekyll, Poole refuses him entry each time. Poole reveals that Jekyll now rarely leaves his laboratory, sometimes sleeping all night in it. The Incident at the Window While Utterson and Enfield are on their regular Sunday walk, they pass Hyde's door. Enfield recalls that Hyde's house connects to the back of Jekyll's home and suggests that they step into the courtyard and look for Jekyll. Through a window, they see their friend, who looks solemn and imprisoned. Utterson invites Jekyll to join their walk, but Jekyll says he dares not, albeit expressing his pleasure at seeing his two friends. They agree to converse through the window, but Jekyll abruptly dons a horrified expression and slams the window shut. Utterson and Enfield leave the courtyard to walk on. The last night one windy March evening, Utterson receives a visit from Poole. Poole tells Utterson that he is afraid and that Jekyll has shut himself in his cabinet. Poole asks Utterson to follow him to Jekyll's house. They arrive to a room full of anxious servants who thank God for Utterson's arrival, and Poole explains that they are all afraid. Poole leads Utterson to the laboratory. When Poole announces him, Jekyll says he will see no one. Poole and Utterson agree that Jekyll's voice sounds different and they discuss the possibility that Jekyll has been murdered and that they have heard his murderer's voice. Poole says that whoever is behind the door has cried for medicine all week and that only notes and orders for supplies have been passed from behind the door. The butler shows Utterson an example, a letter to the druggist begging for a sample of the same substance as received in a previous order, insisting the last sample was impure. The handwriting is Jekyll's, although when Poole once caught a glimpse of the man within, he was wearing a mask and ran away. Utterson decides to break down the door, and he and Poole fetch an axe and a poker. Poole admits that he thinks the creature inside may be Hyde, describing how the masked creature leapt like a monkey into the cabinet when it was seen. The pair orders a footman and some boys to guard the back entrance. They reach the cabinet door, and Utterson shouts that he will break down the door unless whoever is on the other side admits him. Hyde's voice begs for mercy, but Poole opens the door with the axe. They enter and find the room quiet, with the kettle on and tea things laid out. In the middle lies Hyde's body, a vial still clutched in his hand. Utterson smells the vial and identifies that Hyde has poisoned himself. They search the rest of the building for Jekyll, but there is no trace of him. They find the broken key to the locked back door, the remains of an experiment with the drug Jekyll had ordered, and a religious book vandalized with blasphemies in Jekyll's handwriting. Among Jekyll's papers, they discover an envelope containing a new version of Jekyll's will, leaving everything not to Hyde, but to Utterson. There is also a note from Jekyll to Utterson with the same day's date, 
It says that Jekyll will have disappeared by the time he reads the note. Jekyll asks Utterson to read Lanyon's letter first, then his own confession. Utterson decides to go home and read the documents, but assures Poole he will return before midnight, at which time they will call the police. Dr. Lanyon's Narrative Lanyon's letter to Utterson reveals what frightened Lanyon to death. On January 9th, Lanyon had received a letter from Jekyll. In it, Jekyll begged Lanyon for his help. He explained that he needed Lanyon to go to his house. There, Poole would be waiting with a locksmith, and they must break into Jekyll's cabinet. Lanyon then was to take a full drawer containing some powders, a vial, and a book, and bring the supplies to his own home. Jekyll asked that Lanyon be alone at midnight, at which time a man would arrive to collect the drawer. He added that five minutes later, if Lanyon demanded an explanation, all would be revealed. Lanyon feared that Jekyll had gone mad, but nonetheless Lanyon followed Jekyll's instructions. One of the packets in the drawer contained a mysterious white salt, and the vial was full of blood-red, foul-smelling liquid. At midnight, the messenger arrived. He was small, generated feelings of revulsion in Lanyon, and was wearing clothes that were too large for him. The visitor was anxious to obtain the drawer and asked for a GRA, you aided cylinder. Lanyon provided one, and the man combined some of the red mixture with the crystals, causing the liquid to bubble and change color. He then inquired whether Lanyon would be wise and allow him to leave with the glass, or if Lanyon would ask for an explanation and thus gain extraordinary new knowledge. The doctor asked for the truth. First reminding Lanyon of the Hippocratic Oath's vow of secrecy, the messenger drank the potion and underwent a horrible transformation, becoming Henry Jekyll. Lanyon explains in his letter that he cannot repeat the story Jekyll then told him, but knows he soon will die of terror. However, he does reveal that the man who transformed into Jekyll was Carew's murderer, Edward Hyde. Henry Jekyll's Full Statement of the Case Jekyll reveals the story of how he created and became Hyde. Jekyll had been born into wealth and cared deeply about earning the respect of his peers. His worst fault was a certain impatient gaiety of disposition, but Jekyll struggled to reconcile it with his pride and desire to appear serious and respectable in the public eye. He concealed his unspecified pleasures, leading a kind of double life. As a result, Jekyll pondered the duality of man and dreamed of separating the two aspects of his personality into different men, letting his evil be free from guilt and his goodness free from disgrace. Jekyll began to explore a scientific solution and eventually produced a drug that could create a second self. Despite his fear, Jekyll tested his potion. He experienced terrible agony, but once the transformation was complete, he felt younger, lighter, and more wicked. He sneaked into his room and looked in a mirror, seeing Edward Hyde for the first time. Because his inner evil was less developed, Hyde was smaller than Jekyll. His body gave an impression of deformity and decay. Jekyll later observed that none could approach Hyde without a negative physical reaction and believes that this was because, while all other humans are a mixture of good and evil, Hyde was pure evil. Jekyll drank the potion again and reverted to his old self. Jekyll speculates that had he approached the experiment with virtue, a purely good self might have emerged. However, because he undertook it with ambition and pride, his evil was awake and seized the opportunity to escape. Jekyll often fell victim to the temptation to become Hyde, gaining the freedom to indulge his pleasures without harming Jekyll's reputation. He set up Hyde's house in Soho, introduced his servants to Hyde, and wrote the will that so alarmed Utterson. As Hyde, Jekyll's pleasures became monstrous, and Jekyll was horrified by Hyde's actions. However, Jekyll decided that the evil was Hyde's and not his, and while Jekyll worked to make amends for Hyde's actions, he felt no guilt. One morning, Jekyll woke to discover that he had changed into Hyde in his sleep, without taking the potion. Terrified, he stole back into the lab and transformed back into Jekyll, but he noted that Hyde had grown physically larger. Jekyll worried that he might become Hyde permanently if his evil continued to gain influence. He realized he must decide between his personas, and after some debate, chose Jekyll. For two months, Jekyll resisted the lure of Hyde, 
but finally gave in and took the potion. Long caged, Hyde emerged with a vengeance. He murdered Carew and then realized he would be killed if caught and thus fled. Hyde destroyed his papers and transformed back into Jekyll. Jekyll was full of remorse for Carew's death and realized he never could become Hyde again now that the latter was wanted for murder. Racked with guilt, Jekyll labored to do good, performing charity work. One day, Jekyll sat in Regent's Park feeling pride and vanity in his good deeds and suddenly became Hyde. Knowing that if he returned home to get his potion he would be arrested and hanged, he wrote to Lanyon and asked the doctor to collect his supplies. Jekyll waited at an inn until midnight, then retrieved the potion. Hyde was unaffected by Lanyon's horror when he revealed the truth. Though he traveled home as Jekyll from then on, he could only become Jekyll with the help of the potion and usually remained as Hyde. Hyde grew stronger, and Jekyll became sickly and afraid. Hyde only took the potion to avoid hanging for Carew's murder, but played cruel tricks on Jekyll, such as burning or destroying his belongings and defacing his books. Eventually, Jekyll began to run out of the salt he needed for his potion, and unable to obtain more, he wrote his narrative for Utterson. Admitting that he soon would become Hyde permanently, he concludes his confession and prepares for the hour of the death of Henry Jekyll.